Hey guys, Those Communications back again with another review, this time of in my, one of my favorite disaster films, and that is Twister. And this is actually recently, uh, I mentioned this on that, on the latest episode of Talking Cinema, where I talked about this list the Cinema Blend had of disaster movies, and this was of the, what they consider to be the best disaster movies. And a lot of that was ranting, because a lot of that was kind of bullshit, uh, but one of them that was actually not bullshit, that had a reason to be on the list, is this movie, Twister. And um, I've always had a soft spot for this movie. This DVD is a DVD that my family has had for years. This is one of the first films we ever bought on DVD. And also, this is one of, I think, one of, if not the, it was the first film that was ever put on DVD. And the last film that was put on HD DVD. So it was the first film to be released on DVD, and it was the last film to be released on HD DVD. Now the film is uh, the triumphant follow-up uh, to Speed. Um, it's not really a, a sequel, but I'm saying it's a triumphant, triumphant follow-up in terms of the director, uh, John DeMont, who directed Speed in 1995, 1994, and uh, I believe it was 94. Because I, I don't think it was 95, I believe it was 94. I'm just, I'm just, yeah, it's 1994. And this is the next film that he chose to do, is Twister. And uh, I think he chose to do this instead of Speed 2. Good move. Good movie on DeMont. And sadly, this is also the last good movie he directed. This is also a movie that, for some reason, recently seems to get crap. Like, its effects are, don't hold up, or, oh, that's bullshit, that ending, oh, that's so ridiculous and unrealistic. This And I'm like, Fuck you! I, I, it, 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 you know, sorry. I, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I'm it just, in my opinion, people who use that criticism, people who liked this movie back in the day and now hate on it. It's like, what are you doing? Like, it's not like it's a childhood film that had its issues from the beginning. This is never a, a, a very, um, let's say, the smartest, you know, tool in the tool shed, so to speak which doesn't make any sense, but I mean, it's never the brightest bulb, so to speak. But it doesn't mean it's bad. It's entertaining. It's a lot of fun to watch. Is it the most realistic film about twisters? No! Who gives a shit? I don't care. If it was realistic, it'd be boring. That's what it seems like. I mean, maybe it wouldn't be. But what it seems like to me lately, when, the term, when you take realism and apply it to movies, especially lately, to me, that translates into boring and I'm sorry I'll take an exciting not really scientifically accurate fun flick like Twister over a boring scientifically accurate tornado movie any of the week I just will and I think Twister is right up there with films like Independence Day that just is just popular to crap on for some reason now and so so ridiculous and it's so lame what did we ever think about that movie being good and I'm like I don't I don't get it and not everybody feels that way but I mean, it gets a 6.2, which I think is too low, and it gets a lower rating than The Perfect Storm, which I think is an ab is a, an overrated movie, and um, only one point higher rating than Flight of the Phoenix, and it gets a lower rating than The Edge, with Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin, which at the end of the day, I just thought that was an okay movie. Like, that isn't a great film, and that gets like, uh, what, seven points higher of a rating? Like 0.7 points higher of a rating on IMDb than Twister? I, I don't get it. I don't understand. The Edge isn't better than Twister. Anyway, Twister was a huge hit for uh, Warner Brothers. It was made for a, on a $92 million budget, and it made $494 million worldwide. And uh, so it was a pretty big hit. It earned $41 million on on opening opening weekend, making it the number one movie in the North American box office. It went on to earn $240 million at the North American box office. And uh, it now, uh, as of November 2012, uh, it, it sits at number 76 on the All-American North American box office, office charts. And uh, it made $494 million, $471,524 over its initial run. And um, it was criticized for its other aspects. 
of the screenplay and, and the scientific realism of the film, this, you know, at least nowadays. And it was actually, um, but it was pretty much for the most part when it came out praised for its effects and sound design. But now the effects get bashed on because I don't know why, because I think the twister effects in this movie still look great to this day. And um, they look like a tornado. For the, for the time being, in 96, they were impressive. And you also have to consider what they had to work with. And for what they had to work with, the effects artists in this, they did a phenomenal job. And it still looks great. Um, anyway, pretty much the film... The film is uh, written by Michael Crichton and Anne Marie Martin. Uh, it was uh, produced by Michael Crichton and Kathleen Kennedy and Ian Bryce, directed by Jan de Bont, and um, edited by Michael Kahn, who's edited a lot of Steven Spielberg films. He's one of the one of the best editors out there. The film was produced by Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment uh, production uh, company with financial backing from Warner Brothers and Universal Pictures. In return, Warner Brothers was given the North American distribution, while Universal's joint venture company UIP got the international dist distribution. This makes this pretty much makes sense to why Universal was able to use the film for a ride called Twister. I think it was Twister the the ride at Universal Studios, which I'd actually went into. And really, it's not really a ride. It's more of an experience. You go into this room. You see, you see two uh, recorded video uh, interviews with. Uh, with um, with uh, star Helen Hunt and um, Bill Paxton, stars Helen Hunt, and big Bill Paxton, and they're separate interviews. They're not in the same. They're not in the same scene together because I guess they really didn't like each other, and I guess they didn't work well in the film with each other, which doesn't show. It, it does not show at all in the final film, and um, but I don't know if that's really the, the truth. But that's what I've heard for why they had the separate interviews. And then you go and they'd explain stuff to you about tornadoes and about the film. And then you walk into a room and then it would pretty much just be a recreation of the scene where we had the movie theater scene where, you know, the, the theater gets, you know, torn apart. And then you just, you just experience a tornado pretty much. The wind, stuff's flying at you. And uh, it used a lot of different type of uh, techniques to, to make it. And, and nowadays it looks kind of cheap. You know, it doesn't look as real or, or whatever compared to a lot of attractions now. But... For, I remember I, I went there and saw it when I was really young, and I thought it was pretty impressive. And for some reason, I forgot it for all these years until I I uh, just popped in my head while I was watching rewatching this movie, The Good Friend of Mine, on Skype. And then it popped in my head that, oh, there was a ride, and yeah, I went on the ride, and I, I now I remember. So it just didn't leave that much of a much of a uh, impact with me at the time, but. It, I guess a, a good amount of an impact, but it just I, I just replaced that memory of, of Twister the Ride with a lot of other stuff that I guess I thought was more important. Um, anyway, the original concept of the film and a ten page was a ten page tornado chaser story, and it was presented to Amblin Entertainment in 1992 by screenwriter Jeffrey Hilton. Steven Spielberg presented the concept to writer Michael Crichton. Crichton and his wife Anne Marie Martin, who p were paid a reported 22.5 million dollars to write the screenplay. Excuse me. And after spending more than a half a year in pre-production on Godzilla, the 1998 film, which would, would actually go on to be the 1998 film, director Jan DeMont left after a dispute over the budget and quickly signed for Twister. So he wasn't originally going to do Speed 2. He was going to do Godzilla. And then he, well, you know, they tried to get him for Speed 2, but he, he didn't want to do it. And uh, he was working on Godzilla. And Godzilla did not end up becoming a reality until two years later. The production was plagued with numerous problems. Joss Whedon was brought in to do rewrites through the early spring of 1995. When Joss Whedon got bronchitis, Steven Zalian was brought in. Whedon returned and worked on revisions right through the start of shooting in May 1995. He left the project after getting married, and two, uh, and two weeks into production, Jeff Nathanson was flown into the set and worked on the script until principal photography ended. Knowing that I think it's pretty impressive that this film, in my opinion, is, is as good as it is. Knowing there's one of those movies that had to be written on the spot while they were shooting the movie. Halfway through filming, both Bill Paxton and Helen Hunt were temporarily blinded by, by bright electronic lamps used to get, expo get the exposure down to make the sky behind the two actors look dark and stormy. Paxton remembers that these things literally sunburned our eyeballs. I got back to my room and I couldn't see. 
To solve the problem, a plexiglass filter was placed in front of the beams. The actors took eye drops and wore special glasses for a few days to recuperate. After filming in a ditch that contained bacteria, Hunt and Paxton had to have hepatitis shots. During the same scene, she repeatedly hit her head on a low wooden, wooden bridge because she was so, so exhausted from the demanding shoot that she forgot, she forgot not to stand up so quickly. Hunt did one stunt where she, when she opened the door of a vehicle that was speeding through a cornfield, stood up on the passenger side, and was hit by the door in the side of her head when she let go momentarily. As a result, some sources claim that Hunt got a concussion. DeBont said, I love Helen to death, but you know, she can also be a little bit clumsy. She responded, clumsy? The guy burned my retinas, but I'm clumsy. I thought it was a good sport. I don't know ultimately if Jan chalks me up as that or not, but one would hope so. Some crew members felt DeBont was out of control and left five weeks into filming. The camera crew led by Don Burgess left the production after five weeks, claiming DeBont didn't know what he wanted until he saw it. He would shoot one direction with all equipment behind the view of the camera. Then he wanted to shoot in the other direction right away, and we'd have to move everything, and he'd get angry that we took so too long, and it was always everyone el everybody else's fault, not his. Not his. Hmm. If that's true, that's too bad, and that explains why his career went downhill after this film. And the quality of his movies got incre increasingly worse. DeBont claims that they had to make schedules for at least three different scenes. Oh, I think John DeBont did direct Speed 2. What am I doing? Now I just realized that. Duh! It's Keanu Reeves who did not do Speed 2. Jan DeBont did direct Speed 2. He did that in 97, I believe. And so, instead of coming back to work on Godzilla. Or or do some other thing. Yeah, Speed 2, he did direct that. So, yeah. For the, all the, of those of you who might have already written a comment saying, Wait, Jan DeBont did direct Speed 2. Uh, I remembered. So, uh... There's no, so you can not write that comment or you can edit it or something. I, I can't believe I forgot that. That was, well, there's a reason. I, 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 I completely forgot about everything related to Speed 2 because Speed 2 is a piece of shit. It's forgettable. So that's understandable. Anyway, um, so going back to the whole thing, um, Devont claims that they had to make schedules for at least three different scenes every day because the weather changed so often that Don had trouble adjusting. It. That Devont had tr that Don Burgess had trouble adjusting to that. When Devont knocked over a camera assistant who had missed a cue, Burgess and his crew left, much of the shock of the cast. Burgess and his crew stayed on one more week until a replacement was found in Jack and Green. Just before the end of the sh shoot, Green was injured when a hydraulic hose set designed to collapse on cue was mistakenly activated with him inside it. Wow. A rigged ceiling hit him in the head and he injured his back, necessitating a visit to the hospital. Green missed the last two days of principal photography and DeBont took over as his own director of photography. DeBont had to shoot many of the film's tornado chasing scenes in bright sunlight when they could not get over cast skies and asked Industrial Light and Magic to more than double its original plan for 150 digital sky replacement shots. Principal photography had a time moment because Hunt had to return to film another season of Mad About You, but Paul Reiser was willing to delay it two and a half weeks when the Twister shoot was extended. DeBont insisted, insisted on using multiple cameras, and this led to the exposure of 1.3 million feet of raw film. Most films use no more than 300,000 feet of raw film. And DeBont claims the Twister cost, cost, cost close to $70 million, with 2 to $3 million going to the director. It was speculated that the last-minute reshoots in March and April 1996, to clarify a scene about Joe as a child, and overtime requirements in post-production ILM raised the budget to $90 million. Warner Brothers moves up the film's release date from 19, from May 17th to May 10th in order to give two weekends before Mission Impossible open. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's some pretty interesting stuff. Uh, the film uh, received a lot of uh, mixed re reviews from critics. Um, it received a, a lot of mostly favorable reviews, though. Uh, and... Um, yeah, the, the the theme park attraction was called Twister Ride It Out. It wasn't called Twister the Ride. But anyway, yeah, no, that was a pretty interesting sort of backstory there. That's really crazy. Burned his retinas. Helen Hunt almost might have gotten a concussion. Um, here's some more interesting bits of trivia about the film. A recording of a camel's moan was slowed down and used as the sound of, of the tornado. Uh, the real town of Wakita, Oklahoma, had part of its old downtown area demolished by the film crew for the scenes after the Twister passes. The studio then paid for the downtown to be rebuilt. The town also kept the new fire truck used in the film. 
According to the book on the making of the movie, the CGI cow picked up by the Twister Sisters was originally a CGI zebra from Jumanji. Um, an urban legend states that a tornado hit a drive-in theater in the town of Stony Creek, Ontario while this movie was playing. What really happened was that on May 20th, 1996, a tornado hit a drive-in theater in the town of Thorold, Thor, Thorold, interesting name, and that was scheduled to play this movie. One of the screens was damaged when the movie was not actually playing when the tornado hit, but was scheduled to play that evening. During an early scene where when Philip Seymour Hoffman is sitting on his lawn chair, he lifts his leg in the air while laughing. His genitals were fully visible for a split second, and this was edited out for the DVD and VHS releases, but was leaked from VHS screeners and sent to industry professionals. Whoops! And, uh, even though, you know, had some, you know, uh, nut slips uh, there, uh, may rest in peace, may Philip Seymour Hoffman rest in peace. Uh, his character, Dusty, is actually my favorite film role that he's done. I just thought he was so much fun in this movie. You know, food! 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 No, we're not going. Food! We need sustenance. Food! <laughs> Um, the project was a co-production between Universal and Warner Brothers. That's why you have the Psycho uh, and uh, Shining uh, double feature. Uh, both Josh Whedon and Steve Zalian were brought in as script doctors for a fee of $100,000 a week. Um, Michael Crichton and Anne Marie Martin were paid $2 million for their script. The reason the characters reacted to the TV screens going blank and only showing only static before the tornado hits is because in the days before digital TV, it was discovered that a tornado generates a signal that will override the blank channel T2 on TV sets. Digital TVs do not react this way. A jet engine from a Boeing 707 was used to generate wind in some scenes. The red combine that was used in the film near the end when F5 chases after them in the cornfield and that is actually moved in some place in Saskatchewan, Canada, in Watra, Saskatchewan, Canada. Um, after the team leaves Okita, there's a seemingly impossible helicopter shot in which the camera crew dis camera descends several hundred feet in the matter of seconds, ending up mere feet from the convoy. This is achieved by having the cars drive slower than usual and then speeding up the film. Garth Brooks turned down a role of Dustin Davis. So that was going to be Dusty, was going to be Garth Brooks. I'm glad that Philip Seymour Hoffman took that role instead. Uh, trailers contain a shot not in the film, a truck tower hur hur hurtling towards the viewer. This is supposedly one of the test shots that was created during pre-production to, to prove that CGI was capable of executing the effect sequences with the necessary level of realism. Many of the news reports spread throughout the film are actual weathermen from the Oklahoma news stations, including Gary Englund, chief meteorologist at KWTV in Oklahoma City, and Rick Mitchell, chief meteorologist at KOCO in Oklahoma City. The 1969 footage of Gary Englund giving the televised tornado warning to Joe's family is actual archived footage of him issuing a, issuing a tornado warning. However, Gary Englund did not join KWTV until 1972. It Sucks was originally going to be used as one of the taglines for the film, but the producers felt it worked too much of the, to the advantage of disappointing audiences and critics. Yeah, uh, it sucks would be a stupid tagline. I'm glad I didn't use that. Um, John DeMont said he regretted thinking of the hail sequence because it took so long to do and it was very difficult. Also, the crew couldn't find ice blocks big enough in Oklahoma, so they had to find them in other states. Laura Dern was considered for the role of Dr. Joe Harding, which eventually went to Helen Hunt. Um... At the end of the movie, Bill remarks the tornado couldn't take, didn't take the house. In fact, it was originally supposed to. The Hardin County, Iowa Historical Society and many citizens objected to the house being blown up, so it was spared. The area is now a tourist attraction, as the rubble from the barn and fences is still there exactly as it was in the movie. So, um, so that's a little bit of trivia here. Uh, that's a good amount of trivia on the film. So this is almost not even just a, a review. This is almost a retrospective as well. Well, in some ways it kind of is. I, I did grow up with this movie. 
Anyway, the gist of the plot is this. In June 1969, a five-year-old uh, Joe Thornton, played by Alexa Vega, who doesn't look... She did, I, I completely did not know it was the same actress who would go on to be in the Spy Kids movies. Her parents and her family dog, Toby, seek shelter in a storm cellar as a powerful F5 tornado strikes. The storm is so strong that the storm cellar door is ripped off, and Joe's father, Richard Lineback, is sucked out into the storm. Joe, her mother, Joe and her mother, Rusty Swimmer, and Toby survive. And that was a really harrowing, intense way to open the movie. I thought that the film did a great job showing the intensity of this this scene, and uh, it was really tragic. And I thought it was really well shot. Uh, many years later, in the present day, Joe, now grown up, uh, played by Helen Hunt, is now a meteorologist. And she's reunited with her strange husband, Bill Harding, Harding, played by Bill Paxton. It's one of the few roles where Bill Paxton also has uh, pretty much the star, and I, and I like that as well. Um, I think he does a great job in this as well. A former weather researcher and storm chaser who has since been become a weather reporter. He is planning to marry sex therapist Melissa Reeves, played by Jamie Gertz, so I didn't think it was that awful that she deserved to be nominated for Worst Actress by the Razzie Awards. They need Joe's signature on the divorce papers and have tracked her down during an active bout of stormy weather. And it was funny. She plays a sex therapist, and it's like, I have never heard of a sex therapist until this movie. I'm like, I didn't even know that existed. There's such a thing as a sex therapist? Okay. Anyway, um, they need Joe's signature on the divorce papers and have tracked her down during an active bout of stormy weather. And I like that bit about the film, too. I know my friend mentioned this before. Instead of being the, you know, the woman, you know, the typical cliche that the woman is looking for the divorce papers and wants the husband to sign them, it's actually the husband who has the divorce papers and wants his wife to sign them so he can marry this other girl. So, I thought, yeah, it's a different, uh, it's a change in, in the regular convention. And, and I think the film handles that quite well, as it does with a lot of things. Um, the, so, uh, Joe has built four identical torna tornado research devices called Dorothy, based on Bill's designs. The device is designed to release hundreds of sensors into the center of a tornado to study its structure from the inside, with the purpose of creating a more advanced storm warning system. And I like this idea. It's scientifically far-fetched as it could be, or might be. I, I still think it's a cool idea. And uh, I, I was glad to see it in this movie. And uh, it hadn't been done before in a film, so I li like that. And um, Bill and Melissa join Joe and her team of storm chasers, and the team encounters Dr. Jonas Miller, played by Carrie Elways, who is a smug, corporate-founded meteorologist and storm chaser, who is also a resident dickhead. And when Bill discovers that Jonas has created a device based on Dorothy called the Dot 3, he vows to help Joe deploy Dorothy before Miller can claim credit for the idea. And then you have some of like some of the best quotes, you know, the whole thing where you know dealing with this asshole guy. Um, I'm gonna see if I can find it. Yeah, this one I like this. Doctor Jonas Miller is explaining his own version of Dor what what Dorothy can do when Bill uppercuts him in the face. Hey, 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 hey! You son of a bitch! What did you think? I wouldn't find out? What is the matter with you? You stole my design, you son of a bitch! What the hell are you talking about? Dorothy, you took her, you damn thief! Oh, I get it. You want to take credit for my design. She was our, she was our idea, and she was our idea, and you know it. Unrealized idea. Unrealized. <laughs> uh, there's, there's probably, I think there's a little bit more to that line, too, but, to that scene, but, that's just great. I like that scene. You son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, okay. So anyway, um, so that's a fun scene. Punches carry aways. And then during the first tornado, possibly in F1, Joe's truck and Dorothy 1 are just both destroyed. They continue storm chasing Bill's truck with Melissa in their back seat. That was a really when the that was a really well done scene with the the first tornado, I thought. You know, with the whole thing where the truck ends up getting destroyed and they're stuck underneath this this wood bench or whatever. It's not really a bench, it's like a porch or something like that, and it's getting ripped up by the tornado and they're it's only an F1, but I thought the film did a great job. The film, 
throughout the whole movie does a fantastic job, in my opinion, showcasing the power and the strength of tornadoes. And uh, the, the majesty of them as well. And uh, part of that also helps, you know, the score helps a lot too by Mark Mancina and Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, Eddie Van Halen worked on the score. In fact, he did the, the bit of music that plays at the end credits, which I really like, called Respect the Wind. And then he also, uh, along with the band Van Halen, did that really cool song, Humans Being, for the soundtrack. Now, they continue storm chasing Bill's truck with Melissa in the back seat. They find a second tornado confirmed F2 and head outbound a back road where it ships its track. They soon find themselves driving through heavy rain and smack right into the twin tornadoes, spinning around on the highway until the tornadoes dissipate. They're fine, but Melissa becomes hysterical from the ordeal, ordeal and Bill has to calm her down. The team then visits Meg's house in Wakito, Oklahoma for food and rest. Of course, because food! Food! Because <laughs> they need food! And then I like the whole, and then they have this whole scene where they're eating dinner. And then Melissa's asking about why they call Bill the Extreme. And it's like, why do you call Billy the Extreme? And Dusty's like, because Billy is the Extreme. And then this other, you know, Bill is the most out of control son of a bitch in the game. You know, Bill's looking at Joe. No, I think I came in second. So we get this one near Dalton, right? We get this one near Dalton, right? Oh, God. You guys have to get some, get some new stories. I'm going to go wash up. And we are way too close. And Joe's got the video right, and she's filming it. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this shitty-looking green valiant comes pulling her right up in the way. And, and then the character named Belzer, he's like, and Bill, and, and he points to Bill, and this loser stumbles out of the car, like he's got, he's got like a bottle of Jack Daniels in his hand. He's naked. He is butt naked, naked, not naked. I was not naked. Whispering and laughing, Belzer and Belzer, he, he was without apparel. It was like half, half naked, Na naked. Okay, so Joe's yelling at him to get out of the way, right? <laughs> he just strolls up through a twister and says, "Have a drink." And he chucks the bottle right into the twister, and it never hits the ground. The twister caught it and sucked it right up. And the bill directing towards Melissa is like, "Honey, this is a tissue of lies. See, there was another bill, an evil bill, and I killed it." <laughs> So I have a lot of fun with that line. And another thing I really like about this movie is all the characters, all the, the tornado chasers. You don't have a lot of character development on these these characters. You know, the, the group of tornado chasers, you know, uh, Alan Ruck's character, Rabbit, Sean Whalen's character, uh, uh, Scott Thompson, who plays the preacher, uh, Todd Field, who plays the Belzer, uh, Joey Salatnik plays Joey, uh, Wendell Josepher, you know, Haynes. All these characters, they don't have a huge amount of character development, but what the way that the film is shot, they're really likable. And that's one of the things I miss about movies, is that you don't have to have a ton of character development for uh, an audience to care about the characters if they're written in a way that they're likable you know, without showing a lot of character development. And a lot of these characters were had their own unique uh, takes. Uh, the actors had their own unique looks. Um, they all were unique in their own way. They, they in their approaches, and even with their and and even a simple scene where they just show how these characters are unique by showing their tastes in music. I really like that scene where you see all these characters. You see what kind of people they are by the music that they listen to. Uh, Preacher listens to classical music. Dusty's listening to classic rock. You know, some of these other people are listening to you know. Uh, you know, they all have their own eclectic sort of taste in music, and they're also their own eclectic, you know, personalities, you know, that, that fit with the type of music that they like and the type of attitudes that they have. And I thought that was really, uh, that was really well done in this movie. One of the things about this film that is kind of overlooked is that how well it establishes this group of characters, this group of storm chasers, without having a ton of character development, even with Bill. You don't get a ton of character development, but you have enough stories and enough backstory on him that you care about him. And Joe, you have the thing in the beginning, but then it really again, you don't really have you have a her and her aunt, you know, Aunt Joe, and you have all that. It you know, not not Joe, I mean her aunt, um, Meg. So you have her and Aunt Meg, and Joe Joe's her character, so it would confuse. 
but you, you get enough you get enough it's not it's not it's not dominating the film and i think a lot of films nowadays tend to forget that you don't have to have a metric ton of character development in order to get your audience to care about the characters you can get it done with less screen time and i think that twister does a good job with that and um so it doesn't have to do that because then that takes away from the pace it takes away from the fast pace of the film it takes away from the action and I have, you know, so I think a lot of films tend to just be way too character orientated lately and they don't have enough of, a, not, not a lot of action. So they are hinging their whole film on the audience learning enough through just a ton of metric, like I said, a metric ton of character development that we're going to care about this character and it works sometimes, other times it fails. Because if you don't, if you get all the screen time of this character, but the performance is lacking and it's lackluster, and the performance is wooden, or the information you get about this character or these characters you could care less about, and they really don't add much to make them appealing to the audience, then you're just stuck with an hour and a half of just bore, boring character plot, character development. And with Twister, you don't get that. Twister has a decent amount of character development in a fast-paced movie and um, it's only it's, a, it's 113 minutes so it's almost two hours but it doesn't feel like it and it has enough character development to get you to care about each individual character and want them to survive and not get hurt you know and and and, and, and live in the end and, and and also it has a little bit of the suspense go on will they get Dorothy to go off into the tornado will they be able to get Dorothy to work and uh, so I, I just I think it does a great job with that it's one of the more underrated parts of the movie is how well it d does a good job with character development with these different characters in the film with very with, with just with simple things like their taste in music the way they act even the way they look or the way or the cars that they drive or you know I just thought, I thought it was simple but very effective so then they go to you know Aunt Meg's house and Makita to get some food and then they learn that hop, the hopping 5-3 tornado is on the ground and they have trouble finding it. So Joe then drives ahead of the team to intercept the oncoming tornado, but a telephone pole falls in the back of Bill's truck and knocks Dorothy 2 out of the road, disabling him. And um, as the tornado lifts and touches down closer, Bill pulls Joe into the truck and moves, into, moves to safety. The two confront each other over their marriage, Joe's obsession with stopping tornadoes due to her father's death. And I thought it was a really well-handled scene, well-acted and well uh directed scene this is the scene where he you know she just wants him you know I like this scene you know where she's trying to pick up we can do it we can do it we can do it. it's like Joe gotta let it go Joe you gotta let it go and she's like, Joe Joe things go wrong can't explain it you can't predict it killing yourself won't bring your dad back I'm sorry that he died that was a long time ago you gotta move on Stop living in the past and look what you got right in front of you. What are you talking about? Me, Joe. And I decided that very sincere performance by Bill Paxton. You know, I thought he did a good job with, with the lines. And uh, Helen Hunt did a good job with the reactions to it. And they had a nice tender moment in the film that solidified the relationship. And it was just a short moment. It wasn't some long, drawn-out thing. It was a short moment. Another instance of where this movie does a great job with a little bit of amount of time, screen time, and has a very effective moment of character building. And it's a really short moment. It's maybe 4, 30, 45 seconds long. But that moment was enough for you to see these characters and to care about them and actually want them to possibly maybe get back together again. This is where you realize that these two were meant for each other. Instead of, you know, it, you know they've, been, they've been meant for each other from the beginning. And, you know, pretty much, in the, and that's pretty much what happens, is eventually, you know, Bill ends up breaking up with uh, Jamie Gertz, because it really doesn't work. And um, she knows that, too. And she ends up actually being okay with it. She doesn't throw a fit or anything. So anyway, um, the following night after that, you know, moment, an F4 tornado devastates a drive-in cinema during the showing of, of The Shining and, and the psych double feature of Psycho and The Shining, forcing everyone to take shelter in a pit in a car repair shop warehouse. Really well shot sequence, and I like the idea as simple as it is, and I've never seen that before of a tornado 
coming in and wreaking havoc during a drive-in movie. So the whole idea of seeing a movie and then seeing the, the screen get destroyed by the tornado and having it synced in with scenes from The Shining where, you know, he's using the axe and breaking down the door. Jack Nicholson's breaking down the door. You know, and I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. You know, here's Johnny. And then, yeah, that was pretty cool. And the practical effects were really well done. Uh, they're hiding in, in the car repair shop warehouse. This is this is the scene where a lot of that is recreated in the Ride It Out ride at uh, Universal Studios. And I always remember all this stuff flying at them and the preacher guy, a hubcap flew and sliced him in the head. And, uh, you know, some good acting by the actor. He's just like, oh, sh oh, God, oh, God, oh, oh, God, oh, God. You know, and it was really well done, practical. And uh, there's a decent amount of stuff in this movie that was CGI, but a lot of it, a lot of it was, there was a decent amount of it that was also practical, so they had a nice balance of the two. And I really don't know what else would they could have done with the tornado effects. I think Alan did a fantastic job with the CGI of the tornadoes. I think they still look great. I don't care what anybody says. And it's not like you're going to actually shoot a real F5 tornado, or you're going to, what, are you going to use a wind tunnel? How are you going to make a tornado practically? So, you know, CGI was, was the right choice. And I don't think it looked bad either. And um, by this time, Melissa has been traumatized by experiences and leaves while also recognizing unresolved feelings between Joe and Bill. And, of course, stuff with Melissa. You have the whole infamous scene where she's talking on the phone, talking to the sex therapist. She's a sex therapist. And, you know, it, it just saying you know, the kind of goofy sort of stuff. I mean, she's talking to the guy. and it was like, I'm trying to remember, like, I don't know if they have it here. Um... Uh, what was this whole thing for she's talking like? Oh, it's just the, the just the way it was written was just really crazy. The way that she was dealing with all these sex therapists. Oh, this one she's talking to psychiatrist Puris. He's like, she didn't marry your penis. Oh, okay, she didn't only marry your penis. <laughs> and then the whole thing where it's all like, cow. You know, you know, it's like, uh, you know, they have the whole cow. It's like, oh, we got, I gotta go, I gotta go. Uh, we got cows. I gotta go, Julia. We got cows. And I also like the, the scene where Dusty's talking about the suck zone. He's like the suck zone. It's basically the point where the twister sucks you up. That's not the technical term for it, obviously. I just really love Dusty's character. He was a lot of fun, and. Um, And uh, then, uh, so then after that, you know, they have the whole thing where you have the, they survive the drive-in. The tornado then continues on to Wakita and uh, devastates the town, injuring Meg while destroying her house. And after Bill and Joe rescue Meg Ma and her dog from her collapsing house, house, they hear an even stronger form, stronger storm, and F5 is forming 25 miles south of their position. And um, I like the whole scene where they go in and, and the, the house is falling apart. I thought that was... A really well handled sequence, um, practical of course, and it really had a nice uh, bit of hero. You know, it was it was a harrowing scene, harrowing. Uh, uh, you know, bit of suspense there, and I thought it was real well shot. Of course, you had the whole thing where the dog. I have to go get the dog. The dog, you know, the dog barely escapes before the place crashes, like that scene in Independence Day where. The dog jumps in the door, you know, on the side of the subway or, or, or the, not the subway, it's the tunnel. Before it, everything explodes, <laughs> of course, the dog has to make it. But um, I never really had a problem with that. And um, so then, while she's trying to think of something, Joe's trying to think of something that could um, help Dorothy because they tried to, to do anything. So they tried to get Dorothy to go up before, but the tornado wouldn't take her. It would just knock the thing over and knock the truck over and, you know, knock the, the sensors out. Excuse me, and nothing would really happen. And um, going back to the Wakita scene, I really liked the scene before they realized, you know, what the tornado was coming and Dusty 
tells uh, Joe pretty much what's going on. It's coming to Wakita. And I like the re I like just a good amount of acting by Helen Hunt and everybody in the crew when they, they you know just you know when they you know it's just a quick moment where they realize that it's heading to Wakita and I thought their emotions were genuine where they realize oh no it's it's heading, it's going for Mag you know we got to do something and ultimately they end up saving her and then I like the scene too where they're driving by the devastation and you have this couple that Joe sees on the side of the road that look pretty much exactly like her mother and father mother and father did in, in the 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 sort of prologue in the beginning of the film and uh, anyway so she sees her uh, Meg's wind chime sculptures and then she realizes that the most likely method to successfully deploy Dorothy sensors into tornado would be to add additional body surface to catch the wind so this she decides to take and this movie's bit of product placement huge bit of product placement for Pepsi <laughs> products uh ends up taking pepsi cans and pepsi products and cuts them up into uh windmill pretty much windmill shapes and puts the windmill on top windmill uh on top of the the sensors so then when the tornado she they add aluminum from soda cans to work as wind flaps so you know when the the tornado lifts them up it can take the the uh, sensors with it but the deployment of Dorothy 3 is a failure, and meanwhile, Jonas attempts to deploy the Dot 3, but after warning, ignoring war warnings from Bill, his truck is caught by a tornado, and he and his driver, Eddie, Zach Griner, are killed. And I felt for Eddie. I felt for that guy so much. Jonas is being an idiot. Bill's saying, telling him, warning him, it's going to turn, it's going to turn, and he's not listening to him. It's going to change the course. You need to... He's not listening to him. And even Grind Eddie's like, man, maybe we should listen to him. It's like, no, we, you know, we got to do this, and then... Eddie dies because his boss is an asshole. That was really too bad. And, uh, so I feel bad for Eddie. Not necessarily Carol Elways because he was being a dumbass and he was a Darwin Award waiting to happen with the way he was acting. But Eddie, he's just the guy. He's just, he's just, he's just working for this dude. He doesn't deserve to die for, because of his stupidity. But anyway, Joe and Bill then set out on their own and are able to deploy the last door for successfully using Bill's truck as an anchor. And from miles away, the research team sees immediate results on their computers and their sensors. Bill and Joe's celebration is cut short. However, the tornado shifts course towards them. They take shelter in a shed where they anchor themselves at irrigation pipes. Um, earlier before this, though, before they even get to the cornfield, and the, you know, where they released a truck in so the tornado can take it, there's a, I thought it was a really fun scene where they're trying to get to an area where they can drop, you know, they can get get an area where the tornado can pick up Dorothy. I like the moment where they're driving around and all, we got, we got debris, you know, I know. And then there's an explosion. This is like, wow. Did you see? It's just like, did you see that? It just, and it was like, um, did you see that J Joe? And, and, and Dusty's like, Joe, Bill, did you see that explosion? And, and then I love that Joe's like, uh, yeah, we saw it. <laughs> And then you have the whole thing where they, because they after right after they drive through it. And I like this. I always love this moment. They're driving around. They got debris. Stuff's going on all over the road. And they drove through an explosion. And then a, their, a, a house rolls right in front of them. And it's like, and then I, I just love, I just love Bill Paxton the way he delivers this line. I think we're going in. And then they just drive through the house. And then just drive through the house in the middle of the road, and then drive out the window, and then keep on driving. I, I, I that just shows how much fun you know that 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 scene, in my opinion, encapsulates how much fun this movie is. I think we're going in, <laughs> and then uh, they end they end up going through the house and all the debris, and then they end up getting to the cornfield where they can uh, release the truck, so then the 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 uh, tornado can pick up Dorothy, and it does. And then now they're in trouble. Now the F5 is chasing after them. And I thought the effects in this were really well done. F5 is a massive beast of nature. And it looks like that. It totally looks the part. And they go in. And they go in the farmhouse. And I like the thing where they go in the farmhouse. I'm like, who are these people? <laughs> it was just like all these farm implements. Like, these people are nuts. And then they go in. And, the, 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 you know. And, uh. What would they need all these <laughs> tools for? You know, so then they go in and they go into the whole. They tie themselves to the irrigation pipe with belts, and then it's a whole thing where the tornado people call bullshit. There's no way that would work. The belts would break. It's like I don't care. 
it, it gives us a chance to see what the inside of a tornado might look like, which we'll never see in real life because I'm never going to be, you know, the chances of you surviving be, seeing the inside of a tornado is very slim to none. And also, it's a movie. It's not a documentary. It's not a documentary on the Weber channel. It's a movie. I, I've suspended my disbelief all the way throughout the whole movie already. So I don't see a reason not to... To, I don't see any reason to stop doing so at this one scene. I really think that the backlash that Indiana Jones 4 got from that stupid nuke, nuke the Fridge website has bled over into a lot of people's criticisms of other movies and has gotten way out of hand. Not everything has to be realistic, um, and, and especially in a movie. In my opinion, this is my rule, and I've said it before multiple times. If a movie is not, it, this is the only time when I will be bitching about realism in a movie. If it's based on a true story, if it's a documentary, if it's a war film, if it's something like that. But if it's an action movie, it's if it's a, if it's a science fiction film, if it's an adventure film, if it's a movie based on you know inspired by serials of the 30s and 40s, if it's a horror film. If it's any other genre other than documentary, war, or based on a true story, I don't give a shit about realism. I don't care. There's even comedies that are so unrealistic. But I don't care because it's doing it for a laugh. So this does not fall under documentary based on a true story, war movie category. So I don't care. Or sports film. Sports film is another one about realism I can understand. But any other genre, who gives a fuck? And I don't care. So, um, in this instance, it didn't bug me at all. It never did. I was never bitching at the end, like, Yeah, that's bullshit! There's no way that they'd survive that! Straps, you know, with, it's, uh, you know, survive the inside of a tornado, was strapped to a pipe, that's such bullshit, fuck this movie, what a stupid movie this is! It's like, uh, no, it's not rocket science. Just because it isn't... Just because it isn't rocket science doesn't mean it's a bad film. It doesn't mean it's a stupid movie either. But like I said, this movie isn't the brightest bull, but it doesn't matter because really this movie isn't about being super realistic and dramatic. It has the dramatic moments, and they're short but sweet and work really well, and then when it has its action sequences, they do a good job. It's a thrilling, fun movie. It's like a thrill ride. It's entertaining. It's enjoyable. I could care less about realism. And so they end up surviving, much to, you know, uh, nitpickers' chagrin. And uh, the tornado then destroys the shed, and Joe and Bill find themselves in the vortex of a supermassive funnel, securely floating in the air using lever straps. And after the F5 dissipates, Joe and Bill find themselves alone on the floor of the former, the floor of the form, former shed, and then they decide to run their own lab and rekindle their marriage. So it has a happy ending, and um, then it ends with Respect the Wind, and it actually ends with a little bit of the Twister theme by Mark Mancina, which I really like this theme. This is a great theme, I think. I've always liked this music. Anyway, um, ended on that note, um, Twister, uh, still as good as I remember it being, uh, still a classic, I don't care what it almost says, I think this is a great movie, I really don't, I don't have any issues with it, I really don't, like I said, it's one of my favorite disaster movies, I'd probably even say it is my favorite out of the natural disaster movies, it would be Twister, and, um, I need to get my hands on the two discs. Um, but anyway, I have little to say, except uh, I think it's a little bit underrated now. It, it, it's not terrible. It's not one of those movies that was so corny and, and, and we didn't know back in the day. No, it's a good movie. Just like I feel about Independence Day. Independence Day is a good movie for what it is as a pop culture, uh, not, not pop culture, but as a popcorn bit of entertainment. And so is Twister. Twister is, is really good for that as well. Anyway, um... Thanks for watching my review of Twister, and uh, I was rated on five stars. Uh, it gets five and five. And thanks for watching. 
and I will see you guys later. See you.